In the words of a wise woman from a foreign land who is often misunderstood, death is not important. Life is important. And life is eternal. And life is now. Lenny Riefenstahl. <laughs> On March 4th, 1999, Chicago-based comedian Del Close passed away. When his will was read, there was a strange clause included at the bottom. He wished for his skull to be donated to Chicago's Goodman Theater. According to his longtime friend Sharna Halpern, Close hoped that his skull would be used if the Goodman ever produced Shakespeare's Hamlet, but she clarified that he's also willing to be a skull in a desert scene. He's not picky, he just wants the work. The skull was officially presented to artistic director Robert Falls in a public ceremony on July 1st, 1999, during which Falls held the skull aloft and said, Alas, poor Yorick, I knew you, Dell, a fellow of infinite jest. While the Goodman Theatre has, at time of writing, not produced Hamlet since 1950, Close's skull did appear on the Goodman stage in the early aughts, as set dressing in their productions of Pericles and I Am My Own Wife. When it wasn't on stage, Falls kept it in his office, waiting for the day when Close would make his appearance as Yorick. There was only one problem. It wasn't Del Close's skull. There were already rumors of this in the years after it was bequeathed, but an investigation in the summer of 2006 by the Chicago Tribune found several details that indicated it was inauthentic. The presence of teeth when Close had dentures, the V-shaped cuts used for autopsies despite Close not having one, the rusty nails holding the jaw together, clearly more than seven years old. Medical experts were consulted and all agreed. The skull was real, but it was a specimen once used in a classroom. Halpern dodged the question in that July article, insisting it was close as skull, but by October that year was ready to admit that it had been purchased from the anatomical chart company in Skokie, Illinois. According to Halpern, after Dell died, I asked the hospital people if they would help me by taking off the head, and they just laughed. They suggested I call the Illinois Society of Pathologists. They thought about it, and then said, there's a fine line between research and art, and we're concerned about our funding. I called labs, researchers, anatomy shops, and it was no, no, no. Even the Tribune article pointed out that it would have been illegal under Illinois abuse of corpse laws to have performed the beheading and skinning that Close requested. In the end, despite Close imploring Halpern on his deathbed to make sure that the skull donation happened, Close was cremated six days after his death, skull and all. But in the words of Goodman producer Steve Scott, the skull still holds a certain mystique. Close was a real cherished collaborator here. Whether or not it's real, I fervently believe in its reality. It's just nice to have Dell around. But while Del Close may not have succeeded in his quest to give a posthumous performance, across the pond, the legality of such a donation was slightly different. And that all came to a head, so to speak, when a different deceased performer succeeded in playing the role of Yorick, even if the audience at the time didn't know. On December 2nd, 2008, this incredible headline appeared in London's Daily Telegraph. Royal Shakespeare Company to stop using distracting real skull in Hamlet. The article referred to the news story that had broken just two weeks earlier, that during the sold-out run of Gregory Doran's production of Hamlet at the Royal Shakespeare Company, the skull of Yorick held aloft by actor David Tennant had been a real human skull. While Doran had kept the story a secret during the initial run in Stratford, not wanting David Tennant to be upstaged by his deceased scene partner, Tennant had inadvertently let the story slip to the press before the production's plan to transfer to the West End. As a result, the end of November saw a flurry of news stories from the English press about the real human skull being used on stage. Seeing all of his worries about the press upstaging the production come to light, Doran announced on December 2nd that the real human skull would be replaced by a replica for the West End run. The play once again sold out, prompting the BBC to remount and film the production for the holidays in 2009, at which point Doran revealed that they had actually continued using the real human skull during the West End run without telling anyone. Moreover, Doran clarified that they were definitely going to be bringing the real skull back for the BBC production. And thus, the skull is immortalized. Today you can see it in the BBC film. Yes. Poor Yorick. I knew him or I show. And on a 2011 UK postage stamp, featuring the image of Tennant with the skull. But all of this is the part of the story that people already know. The using of a real skull, the announcement that they'd stop using a real skull, the reveal that they never stop using a real skull. If we want the full story, we have to go all the way back to the beginning and answer the question that you're probably asking right now, whose skull was it? 
Robert Andrzej Krauthammer was born in 1935 in Poland. When the Second World War began, the four-year-old Robert was moved with his family into the Warsaw Ghetto. In 1942, his parents, hoping to save him from the concentration camps they were likely to end up in, smuggled him out of the ghetto to live with his grandmother. In the process, he was given false identification papers with a new name, one he would continue to use after the war, Andrzej Tchaikovsky, later westernized to Andrzej Tchaikovsky. Andre and his grandmother were, in fact, moved to a concentration camp in 1944, but against all odds were never outed as Jewish, and thus avoided being sent to a labor or extermination camp. After the war ended, they returned to Warsaw, and Andre returned to his passion, piano. He became a student at the state school in Łódź, and later at the Paris Conservatory. In 1948, he gave his first performance, focusing on the works of Chopin, as well as his own compositions. Throughout the 1950s, Andre rose quickly in the classical piano world, cutting records for both RCA Victor and Pathé Columbia labels, as well as an international tour schedule as a guest artist with the world's best symphonies. He settled in 1960 in London, remaining there until his death. He divided his time between concert performances, composing new works, and a deep and abiding love of two hobbies, playing bridge and reading the works of William Shakespeare. In fact, at the time of his death, at age 46, Andre was about 24 measures of music away from completing his only opera, based on The Merchant of Venice. Don't worry, it was eventually performed in 2013. But upon reading his will in 1982, his agent, Terry Harrison, found this unusual note at the end. Clause 13. I hereby request that my body, or any part thereof that may be used for therapeutic purposes, including corneal grafting and organ transplantation, or for the purposes of medical education or research, in accordance with the provisions of the Human Tissue Act of 1961, and in due course, the institution receiving it shall have my body cremated, with the exception of my skull, which shall be offered by the institution receiving my body to the Royal Shakespeare Company for use in theatrical performance. Now, when I say Harrison was shocked, that's not entirely accurate. What shocked him was seeing it in print, but Andre had discussed this donation before. According to Harrison, Andre had previously expressed dissatisfaction with the prop skull in a production of Hamlet. Quoting Harrison, he hated the way it was done. When he saw it at the RSC, he said, I am going to leave my skull to the RSC. They really should have a proper skull. It doesn't work with the plastic thing they have. And then we looked at his will, and there it was. What this all led to was a phone call between William Lockwood, properties manager for the RSC, and MJ Duckworth, undertaker for the funeral home Reeves and Payne, inquiring as to whether the company would accept a donation of one human skull. Lockwood, unsure of how to answer, forwarded the query to joint artistic director Terry Hands, who was immediately in support of the donation. In a statement to the press, Hands said, Andre was passionate about Shakespeare and had attended many performances at the RSC. We were honored and we accepted. It was agreed that when we next played Hamlet, it would be used. Of course, Hans only gave a statement to the press because he was asked to. See, Hans, Harrison, and the funeral home managers all agreed that it would be best if this donation was kept out of the public, for fear of any backlash or unnecessary publicity. However, during the process of preparing and donating the skull, someone leaked it to the press, leading to headlines like, Hamlet gets a skull in bequest from the Daily Telegraph, and Pianist's skull waits in the wings from the Times of London. Both articles mentioned that the RSC had no plans to stage Hamlet in the upcoming season, their most recent production of the play had been in 1980, but a spokesman for the company clarified to reporters that when the next production of Hamlet rolled around, they would cast Andre as Yorick. Until then, the skull arrived at the RSC on July 20th, 1982, and was immediately placed on the roof of the building to air out. It remained there for the next two years. The next production of Hamlet came around in 1984, directed by Ron Daniels and starring Roger Rees as the Danish prince. And depending on your definition of the word use, it was technically the first production to use the Tchaikovsky skull, just not on stage. The production was advertised with this lush painted poster of Hamlet, and while posing for it, Rees did in fact hold Andre's skull. Said Rees, the artist was Philip Kaur, and he remarked that it must be a real skull, because it still had bits of gristle around the ear ports, and various places. While this production elected not to use the real skull in performance, it was at this point that it was determined to be dried out enough, and was moved from the roof to prop storage, stored in the same tissue-lined cardboard box that it was delivered in. The next Hamlet came in 1989, in a production directed again by Daniels and starring Mark Rylance. Rylance was determined to use Andre's skull in performance this time, but a trio of rehearsal notes tells the story of that attempt. 
February 13, 1989. Mark Rylance has asked whether it would be possible to use the real skull that was donated to the RSC as Yorick's skull. March 23, 1989. We will be using the real skull for Yorick, but we'll need a standby in case of accident. April 7, 1989. We are no longer using the real skull as Yorick, but would like to use a cast of it, complete with teeth. Reports from the rehearsal team indicate that while initially on board, Rylance grew increasingly squeamish about the prospect of using a real skull in performance, as did the rest of the team. It's also worth pointing out that Daniel's blocking for the 1989 production had Hamlet carrying the skull around for the remainder of Act 5, so it was likely under much greater physical stress than other prop skulls would be in the same situation. Ultimately, Andre was again returned to his box. And for several years, that was the end of the story. The RSC produced Hamlet again in 1992, 97, 2001, 2004, and 2006, none of which appeared to have inquired about using the Tchaikovsky skull. It seemed like Andre's dying wish, his goal of replacing the RSC's unconvincing fake skulls in Hamlet, would go unrealized. But then came Gregory Doran. Gregory Doran was, at the time, the chief associate director of the RSC, and had previously made waves with the production of Macbeth in 2000, a slate of five less performed Jacobian plays in 2002, and a darker modern set Midsummer in 2005. Even before his Hamlet began rehearsals, it had sold out its entire repertory run in Stratford, off the weight of the production's two major stars. Living legend Sir Patrick Stewart as Claudius, Be or not a bee. That is the question. And, at the time, current Doctor Who, David Tennant as Hamlet. Hello. Excuse me. No interrupting, am I? Mr. Shakespeare, isn't it? Oh, no. No, no, no. Who let you in? But it was the final member of the cast, introduced to the team by Doran during the first rehearsal, that would really make the production stand out. The Tchaikovsky Skull. Said Doran, This play has to touch something in us. We have to face our own mortality, and Hamlet has to face that. It was sort of a little shock tactic, although, of course, to some extent that wears off, and it's just Andre in his box. Unlike Rylance, who had expressed some unease about using the skull in 1989, Tennant was immediately on board to use Andre's skull, both as a way of invigorating his performance and as a way of finally fulfilling the pianist's final request. As mentioned, when the play began performances on August 5th, 2008, no one outside of the company knew that it was a real skull. So, for 22 performances over the course of three months, Andrei Tchaikovsky finally appeared on stage in a production of Hamlet. Yeah, how those lips that I have kissed? I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now? A transfer to the West End was already planned when Doran's Hamlet was announced, but half a month passed between the production's November 15th closing date at Stratford and its December 3rd opening date on the West End. And just about a week after the production closed, the news broke. Uh, talking of the afterlife, what has David Tennant controversially been holding this week? A skull? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's holding the skull of a guy who died in the early 80s, who, who willed his skull to be used at some point in a production of Hamlet, and that's what they've been really? doing. Yeah, as you're, yeah. yeah. He yeah. was a concert pianist and he loved Shakespeare, and his yeah. dying wish was to have his He's skull used. He's called Andre Tchaikovsky. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if he was a relation or not. No, nor do I. And that brings us to where we began, the reveal to the press that the Royal Shakespeare Company was using a real human skull on stage. The story of Andrei Tchaikovsky's odd bequest, which was already public knowledge to anyone reading the news in 1982, was suddenly back in the news in 2008. When announcing his intention to retire the skull for the West End run, Doran commented, I suspect Andre would have been amused by the fact that his cranium became a question on Have I Got News For You, but his bequest to the RSC was deeply sincere. I hope other productions may, with the greatest respect for Andre, use the skull as he intended it to be used, for precisely this purpose. Terry Harrison, however, who had gone to great lengths to ensure that Andre's final request was granted, was not a fan of the decision to replace the skull. To quote from that December 2nd article, Mr. Tchaikovsky's former agent and friend, Terry Harrison, has said that he is disappointed by this decision. I understand that artists are very sensitive, most are, and I could imagine someone not being very comfortable. So I think that David Tennant was wonderful that he did it, he told Channel 4 News. Mr. Harrison added that the pianist hated the use of a plastic skull. But the quote to come out of the media scrum that's most important for our purposes in this video is actually from David Tennant, describing the moment when Doran revealed the donation to the cast. When I heard he had done this, I thought, that's brilliant, that's what I'm going to do. But apparently you can't anymore, the law's been changed. Which brings us to the center of this story. How was Andrei Tchaikovsky able to donate his skull to the theater when Del Close wasn't? 
In the end, it comes down to the only thing more powerful than the performing arts. Dense, archaic medical laws. Earlier in this video, I glazed over the details of exactly how this skull made its way from the funeral home to the RSC, but it is important to clarify it now because the six conditions that had to be met in order for this donation to go through almost guarantee that nothing like this will ever happen again. Which might as well bring us to point one, legality. As mentioned in his will, Andre's ability to donate his skull separate from the rest of his body was protected under the United Kingdom's Human Tissue Act of 1961, which states the following. If any person, either in writing at any time or orally in the presence of two or more witnesses during his last illness, has expressed a request that his body, or any specified part of his body, be used after his death for therapeutic purposes or for purposes of medical education or research, the person lawfully in position of his body after his death may, unless he has reason to believe that the request was subsequently withdrawn, authorize the removal from the body of any part or, as the case may be, the specified part, for use in accordance with the request. The phrase there that's most important for our story is, for therapeutic purposes. In brief, this was the clause that allowed Andre not just to donate part of his body separate from the rest, but specify that the reason for the donated part did not have to be scientific or medical in nature. So, in effect, that makes donating your skull to a theater company legal. Although Terry Harrison and the RSC did consult with the British Home Office in 1982 just to ensure that the donation was legal. Which brings us to points two and three, an executor of the will willing to push for the donation to happen, and a receiving organization willing to take possession of it. Of the six points, these are the only two that Andrzej Tchaikovsky and Del Close have in common. Terry Harrison and Sharna Halpern for point two, and the Goodman and the RSC for point three. Past this point, things get a lot more complicated. Point four would be a hospital willing to perform the decapitation. Tchaikovsky died at Churchill Hospital in Oxford in the Sobel House Ward, reserved for patients with incurable illnesses. His cause of death from colon cancer was officially signed off by Dr. Christopher Joseph Cates. However, it's unclear which member of the hospital staff was tasked with performing the removal and how precisely the surgery was done. Still, it was definitely Churchill staff that separated Andre's head from his body in accordance with Clause 1-4 of the Human Tissue Act. No such removal shall be effected except by a fully registered medical practitioner who must have satisfied himself by personal examination of the body that life is extinct. Point five is the funeral home, specifically one willing to let the body be discharged for dismemberment and then return for processing without a head. Reeves and Payne, the parlor that processed Tchaikovsky's body, would typically not have allowed for such a procedure, but given Harrison's insistence that the will be followed and the RSC's willingness to accept the skull, they relented and allowed the body to be delivered headless before it was cremated for funeral proceedings. Said M.J. Duckworth, the undertaker who called the RSC in 1982, Mr. Tchaikovsky's friends and executors desperately wanted to fulfill his wishes, and we are here to do what we can for our clients. And then point six, arguably the most important one, and the one that I have the least information about. The museum. In an article about the bequeathment, this line appears. At virtually the last minute, Reeves and Payne was able to obtain Andre's remains from the hospital, sans cranium, in time to prepare his ashes for the memorial service on July 2nd. The head was turned over to a museum for processing. Presumably, this refers to the work of transforming Andre's severed head into a clean, ready-for-performance skull. And after a month of research and many emails leading to many dead ends, I cannot say which museum in the UK this head was handed off to. Perhaps there's a certain element of not wanting the public to know which museum was willing to do the processing. All I know is that on July 18th, 1982, the cleaned skull was delivered to Reeves and Payne, who sent it to the RSC two days later. These latter three points are the ones that truly prevented Del Close from donating his skull to the Goodman. Even if Halpern had been willing to go around Illinois law, Close died at Illinois Masonic Hospital, and we already heard from Halpern their response to her request for their assistance in skeletonizing Close's head, as well as the response from all subsequent medical professionals and funeral homes. The more you look into it, the more impossible it is to satisfy points four through six anywhere in the US, thus making it impossible to donate your bones anywhere when you die. An article from The Atlantic entitled, You Can't Keep Your Parents' Skulls, sums it up in a quote from human remains law expert Tanya Marsh. I will argue with you all day long that it isn't legal in any state in the United States to reduce a human head to a skull. In the United States, sure, but the RSC is of course in England where the Human Tissue Act was in effect in 1982, so 
if you could somehow manage to clear the other five points, the executor, the receiving organization, the decapitation, the funeral home, and the museum, it was technically possible to donate your skull. The key word, of course, being was. As David Tennant alluded to, a 2004 update to the Human Tissue Act effectively repealed the 1961 provisions that allowed for Andre's donation. The only human remains that are currently approved for display in England are those that are more than 100 years old, the kind already in the holdings of museums and laboratories before the passage of the 2004 law. In fact, the RSC ran into this new version of the law during their 2008 Hamlet. I mentioned that they used Andre's skull on opening night, but as it was under 100 years old, they were legally prevented from doing so during previews, until a license to display human remains was granted by the Human Tissue Authority. Incidentally, in its place, they used a prop skull. A 200-year-old prop skull, originally used by Edmund Keane in 1813. Which of course the RSC just has. It's probably fair at this point to mention that the Royal Shakespeare Company is by no means the only company to use a real human skull on stage for Yorick, not by a long shot. To select just one example out of many, when famous thespian Sarah Bernhardt played Hamlet to much acclaim in 1899, she used a real human skull gifted to her by, true story, Victor Hugo. As long as scripts have called for human remains on stage, using the real bones has always been the easiest alternative to building fake ones. Still, the Tchaikovsky skull is certainly the most recent and high-profile example of a theater company using a specific person's skull as a prop. Another Hamlet, starring Jude Law, played the West End in 2009, and used a real skull purchased from an American anatomical parts supplier. It's a similar situation to the skull currently at the Goodman. While it is a real skull, it was first used for scientific pursuits, and its original owner cannot be identified. Taking into account 21st century concerns about the desecration of corpses and the ethics of posthumous performance, it's highly unlikely that any other audience member could successfully donate their skull to the RSC. And we know this because somebody tried. In 1995, nearly a decade before the Human Tissue Act was amended, English actor Jonathan Hartman announced his intention to donate his skull to the Royal Shakespeare Company, for the same purpose as Andre. However, a spokeswoman for the RSC indicated that they would likely reject the donation this time. After all, she said, they've already got one. What? He says they've already got one. Are you sure he's got one? Oh yes, it's very nice, sir. At time of writing, the Royal Shakespeare Company has produced Hamlet again in 2010, 2013, and 2016, but none of these productions utilize the Tchaikovsky skull. It's entirely possible that another production could use it again, certainly it's just sitting in the RSC Proc archives, and perhaps another director wouldn't share Doran's concern over letting the skull upstage its living collaborators. But then again, aside from Andre's concerns about the believability of the prop, what is gained from using a real human skull in performance? Claire Van Campen, the music director for the 1989 Hamlet, reflected on the decision not to use the skull thusly. As a company, we all felt most privileged to be able to work the Gravedigger scene with a real skull. However, collectively as a group, we agreed that, as the real power of theater lies in the complicity of illusion between actor and audience, it would be inappropriate to use a real skull during the performances. Even in 2008, the main reason the skull was used was for the benefit of the acting company, not for the audience, who didn't even know it was real, and during the West End, specifically thought it wasn't real. In the end, the skull is real on stage not because it was really inside someone's head, but because the actor playing Hamlet believes it was really inside Yorick's head. If a real skull helps the actor believe that, then I suppose it doesn't hurt to use it. But given all the hurdles that the skull would have to clear in order to be donated today, perhaps it's best for all of us that Andrei Tchaikovsky and his friends were able to accomplish the feat once. Perhaps, like the Royal Shakespeare Company, we only need one human skull. Does thou think Alexander looked to this fashion in the air? Even so. And smelt so. Even Woo! so, my lord.